of course, knowing me, has landed me with the most ungrateful and demanding job of the whole day. How on earth I am, go am I going to summarize all this? Well, be with me, bear with me, I'm not going to summarize, because I think we've had such a marvelous combination of people, of ideas, of emotions, that really, you know, trying to give a one-liner for everybody would take me through the whole night, and you don't want that. But there are a few things that I think we, we, we can learn. And um, maybe the most interesting thing is that I looked through the, the TED commandments. You know, when you are a speaker at TED Global, they send you the 10 TED commandments and the things you are supposed to do and not to do. So one is, for example, don't flaunt your ego. And I'm not going to do that because I'm going to tell you about others. It also says, feel free to comment. We'll comment. And then, above all, it says, make the complex simple. Well, I'm not sure how we're going to do that for today. And then Amsterdam, TEDx Amsterdam, adds an additional rule for speakers and says, don't try to cover too much. Well, Jim, I mean, you know, we'll do this next time. But any, oh, and then they add, in the end, they said, and rehearse in front of a trusted friend. Well, I'm going to call on you to be my trusted friend. <laughs> I'm going to rehearse right here on the spot. So listen to my learning curve today's learning curve, and see whether you've learned the same thing as I have. Because in this day of rich ideas, of emotions, of science, of technology, of compassion, of moving bodies, of moving spirits, a ballot for the mind indeed, I think the one thing I pick out, above all, is the versatility of human nature. We are so diverse. And our minds are so diverse. We think up weird ideas, things that nobody else has ever done. We come up with technology that never, ever before we could have imagined. We come up with shapes, with sounds, with new things. And they all somehow seem to match. And maybe that's my second lesson, my, my other thing that I feel so strongly about myself as somebody who comes from a technical background and loves science, as well as culture, and music, and art, and the social sciences. TED is really about what I would call the third culture. It's not about, remember the two cultures of C.P. Snow's, the sciences, we would today call them the nerds, and the arts, you know, the literati. No, it's really about bridging the gaps between the disciplines, and also between arts and science. So my second lesson is, it is indeed true that something new is emerging, a third culture which is not discipline-oriented only, not only driven by being good at one thing, but driven by wanting to be curious, by wanting to be understanding about the whole breadth of our world around us. So this versatility of expression, if you want, that's the, to me, also the, the gist of what human, human nature is about. What are we about? We are about survival, first of all. Survival through those hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution, but also survival under very dire conditions in Afghanistan, in places that we haven't mentioned, but that as, are as difficult. The Congo, where I used to work myself, many other parts of the world where survival is the first goal and mainly, for a long time, the only goal. But we do survive as a species. We survive crises, we survive even something we haven't talked about, to my great amazement. We, have, we are surviving a financial crisis. We are surviving a crisis of the euro. Not mentioned, or hardly mentioned today. Very interesting. This is a different crowd from the ones that write the newspapers. That's for sure. But then, human nature is also and we've seen this embodied in all of the speakers, it's also about the capacity to focus, to know what you want to do, to be good at it, and to pursue it. The capacity to concentrate and to be brought at the same time. And that, I think, is a unique gift. And the capacity to serve, to be compassionate, to get tears in your eyes when you hear about something that has happened to others, when you can try to be in empathy with those who have suffered, even if you have not suffered. And human empathy, although we now know it also exists with primates, I think makes us really humans. And we've seen 
many very, very beautiful demonstrations today that I will not sum up to you, but you have all, I think, your own idea about that, your own feelings. So yes, indeed, there is a learning curve in human history because compassion and empathy were not um, that frequent, or at least not as much part of culture uh, a few thousand years ago, perhaps. And even as recent as a century ago or two centuries ago, it wasn't obvious that the rich had to have some compassion with the poor or that rich countries had to do something about poor countries. So as we are learning about our human nature and as we are learning as countries, we perhaps become indeed a little bit wiser, a little bit more positive, and hopefully also curious about other lives. But passion is also emotion. And here, I think the wonderful thing today, and my third point, if you want, is that we've learned to see how art and science can really tell something to one another. Art is not just an illustration. It's something that uh, focuses our curiosities, that brings us further. And there's no more fertile ground, I think, than the one where science and art, in the most wide sense, can actually meet. And if we can foster that, also in our schools, in our society, where you have a separate section which is called science in the newspapers and the universities, and another one that's called art. I mean, I'd love to see more people who can bridge that gap. Art, to me, is not only the expression of emotion or the expression of the nonverbal, it's also the way of exploring other worlds, a way to explore, um, indeed, as we saw so beautifully, with mirrors points of view that we haven't taken before. It's expressing, if you want, the non-linear, the non-rational. So human nature is about giving us glimpses, glimpses of other worlds, and that I think we've seen a lot today. We've seen that perhaps most embodied also in the one geographical area that we did talk about today, and that's the Middle East, and how fitting that it is the Middle East not only because, of course, this is the, the year of the Arab Spring that we will never forget, the year that we've seen things happening in the Arab world for those of us who visited us at so often, we wouldn't have expected. The emotions in Tahrir Square, but also the events from Syria to Lebanon to Libya to Morocco are quite unique. But it's telling for me also, significant for another reason because the seat of our civilization is in the Middle East. In fact, you know, with some mind-bending, you could say that the first stead actually existed in Baghdad. It existed there where the uh, Quranic and rabbinic schools came together and actually discussed, discussed in a very wide and open sense, and we have reports from that, not called reports, but commentaries, um, that testify to the great uh, openness of thinking. And indeed, it's the seat of our civilization in the Middle East. It's the seat of many schools of learning. And it's wonderful if some of that historic past would come back to us. So that's for the proto-TEDs of the Middle East. And I hope that those of you who organize TEDs in the Middle East will remember that and will try to make that link, because it's a beautiful link. Um, but above all, above anything else, this whole day made me ponder about one other aspect of human nature, and that is the need for controlling our impulses. This may be strange after I've just talked about passion and art and so on, but if you look at the history of civilization, and in fact there's a very famous American Dutch sociologist who lived and died here, Norbert Elias, who wrote about the process of civilization, and his main uh, thesis is that um, civilization comes with greater control of impulses. Control, for example, in the sense that we do not spit in public, we don't at least try not to. We control violence, the state is there to control ourselves and control others. We also have something called self-control, inner directed self-control, whereby we know there are certain things we don't do anymore. We don't have sex in public, usually, we don't eat as much as we would like to eat, we try to control ourselves. All that is sort of loosely fitted into the process of civilization. You could argue that civilization is about increasing control over human nature. 
Now here comes the paradox, because it's this control over impulses that makes it possible for us to, to work together, to cooperate, to share ideas, to listen to one another. Because if you continue shouting, and I continue shouting, we cannot listen. But here's to the paradox of today, one that we haven't touched, but one that I feel very strongly about and would like to share with you. Yes, we have a learning curve in our societies of increased control. But we also see today, in the last few years, an increasing move towards uncontrollable things, uncontrollable behavior, un unself-controlled behavior. I came back to live in this country after many years abroad a couple of years ago, and the thing that shocked me most is that you can actually get killed nearly here by a bicycle. And bicycles do have the right of way everywhere, and they don't stop for one another. There is this tendency of it's me, me, me. This, this whole idea that you need to control your impulse to want to go faster than somebody else, to not have the patience to wait for somebody else. This idea of losing self-control, for example, in traffic, or for, for example, in trying to get into a train, try to get into a Dutch train. It really is a battle nowadays. And you recognize that. And there is something, even at a society level, we actually are confronted more and more with groups in society who feel utter distrust of other people, who feel a lack of trust in the state as a whole, in politics and politicians, in science, in the rational. And it's this increasing mish mishmash, this mix of irrationality, of fears, indeed, as we discussed, of the lack of trust in others, of wanting things for you and wanting them immediately, that actually goes against the grain of what has been the great movement of our society of control of human nature. And I want to share that with you because I am worried on, of how this movement leads to greater nationalism, to greater anti-European feelings, to greater feelings of I want my thing and I don't want other people's things. And I don't want other people even to be considered right now. Lastly, we did touch upon nature. Nature is a source of inspiration, even to the extent bordering on the noble savage the natural way of life as the only way or the best way of living, but nature also as an inspiration for architecture, but for the way we see the world. And indeed, it's this, this whole idea of a circle rather than a line that brings me to think that our future is maybe not a learning curve, but a learning spiral, something that turns around, that makes us move up as we go up, that makes us share our ideas, in a circle that forever and ever moves us up in some kind of process of better understanding, greater civilization, more inclusiveness. It's not going to be an easy road. It's more difficult to share as the world gets larger and more people have to be included. Yes, it's easier perhaps with the internet, and we've seen many beautiful examples of social media. But it's also going to be difficult to do something between the anonymous and the individual, between the states and that which transcends the state. But I think that's the great, great challenge. And the, the last lesson that I've learned, the one that I expected, to be frank, but the one that is so wonderful to hear, is that I did not hear anybody give a speech which is negative, a speech is anti the world, anti the state, anti-science, or a kind of doomsday speech, saying, you know, we're with seven billion people. This is what I hear all the time in my own discipline. People saying, you know, there's seven billion people, the world is going down the drain, we have no resources left, it's all very difficult. No. The TED group is always very positive, and it's this positive sense that I think is so important today, because the, the reactions that I just mentioned to you, this lack of control, have a lot to do with fear, and fear is often the fear of the unknown or the fear for losing something. And it's this wonderful positive emanation from, from this group, this idea that, yes, indeed, we can. We can use science in a positive way. Yes, we can move ahead. Our world will be a better world because of technology and because we can make art and science talk together. And because you and me, all of us, will go away from this evening and bring something, our own selection of having learned something. Because I think that's, that's my ultimate criterion for a good day. It's a day in which I've learned something. And I've learned a lot today. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And perfect timing as well. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you.